Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome to Collegeville Connections, a series of online events presented by the Collegeville Institute, which is located on the campus of St. John's University in Abbey in Minnesota. Collegeville Connections highlights the work of Collegeville Institute alums and friends from across the spectrum of Collegeville Institute programs. It provides an opportunity for new guests, program alums and friends to stay connected to each other and to the Collegeville Institute. Most importantly, you'll learn a lot from our remarkable guests. I'm Stina Kielsmeyer Cook, Director of Communications for the Collegeville Institute. And before I introduce our guests for today, I'm going to turn to Susan Sink, a, sa a staff member at the Collegeville Institute. Susan is running the tech side of things for us today and will tell us what we need to know about logistics. Hi everyone, thank you for attending today's event. Um, just two little housekeeping things. One, um, we are going to be using the Q&A uh, feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen for asking questions. And you can ask any question you want. I'm, I will be the only one seeing the questions. Um, I'll address anything that you have that's just purely technical. And then we'll save the kind of real content questions for the end for the Q&A. Um, you can also, I believe, chat with me individually, um, but please don't otherwise use the chat. And also we are going to be streaming this live on Facebook Live. So if you do lose contact, you can always go to the Collegeville Institute Facebook page and it will be playing streaming there and also be available later in the day to share. It will be recorded. Uh, okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Susan. All right, so today um, I'm so excited to introduce you all to our guests today and to this event. We, are, we have the privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, of hearing from two women who well understand the global migration crisis, a crisis that has displaced nearly 80 million people, the highest number since World War II. And yet stories of refugees rarely make our headlines. Kalkalia Yang and Jessica Godot are two writers who tell refugee stories in the United States and around the world, showcasing the diverse experiences of displaced people. We're really fortunate to have them with us today. So um, before I turn it over to them, I'm gonna give you a little rundown of their bios so you can know who it is that you're listening to. <clears throat> so first I'll introduce um, Kalia. Kao Kalia Yang is an award-winning Hmong American writer. She is the author of the memoirs, The Late Homecomer, a Hmong family memoir, The Song Poet, and Somewhere in the Unknown World. Yang is also the author of the children's books, A Map into the World, The Shared Room, and The Most Beautiful Thing. And if you're looking for links to these, we'll be putting them in the chat soon. So please go check, them, check out the books. She also co-edited the groundbreaking collection, What God is Honored Here, Writings on Miscarriage and Infant Loss by and for Indigenous women and women of color. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yang's literary nonfiction has been recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn USA Literary Awards and the Dayton's Literary Peace Prize and garnered three Minnesota Book Awards. Her children's books have been listed as an American Library Associate no Notable Book, a Kirkus Best Book of the Year, winner of the Minnesota Book Award in Children's Literature and the Heartland Booksellers Award. Kalkali Yang is a recipient of the McKnight Fellowship in Prose the International Institute of Minnesota's Olga Zolte Award for her community leadership and service to new Americans and the Ordway Center for the Performing Arts 2019 Sally Award for Social Impact. So we're so excited to have you here, Kalia. Um, next, I'm gonna introduce Jessica Godot. So Jessica Godot is an alumna of the Collegeville Institute's Summer Writing Workshops. And she's also the author of After the Last Border, Two Families and the Story of Refuge in America which was named a New York Times editor's choice book and the forthcoming We Were Illegal, which will also be published by Viking. She has written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Teen Vogue, among many other places, and is a former columnist for Catapult. She produced projects for Teen Vogue, Ask a Syrian Girl, and A Line Birds Cannot See, a documentary about a young girl who crossed the border into the US on her own that was distributed by The New Yorker. She has a PhD in literature from the University of Texas and served as a Mellon Writing Fellow and Interim Writing Center Director at Southwestern University. Godot has spent more than a decade working with refugees in Austin, Texas 
and is the co-founder of Hill Tribers, a nonprofit that provided supplemental income for Burmese refugee artisans for seven years. So this is a great rundown list of all your accomplishments and wonderful books. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kalia, um, to do a short reading from your most recent book. Thank you, Stina, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to Jessica for inviting me to be a part of this hour with her and Collegeville for hosting us. I'm gonna read from um, Somewhere in the Unknown World, which came out in November of 2020. So it's still a newborn. I still hold it very close to my heart as I do all my books though. So I should say that. Dedication. For the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children whose fates have been held by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. And it opens with a poem by my favorite American poet, the great Lucille Clifton. Mm. Quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow-eyed woman sits with her daughter, quilting. Some otherwhere alchemists mumble over pots, their chemistry stirs into science, their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman, threading together her need and her needle, nods toward the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does this poem end? Do the daughter's daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their table? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? And I will read from um, Segmuda Bonsai's story. Sigmuda is an incredible playwright in these cities. Obviously, she can write her own stories. Um, but she decided, and I agreed, to write her story and that of her mother. Because words are my gift, and this is my offering to her incredible story. And so I will read from a part um, right before her mother's death, um, Sinutha. No more killing, no more war. King Savan Batana, Queen Kampui, and Crown Prince Bong Savan have all been killed. They are now killing the governors one at a time. Oh no, what about my father? My father has left. He has left his children behind, all of us. My six brothers and sisters, my countless stepbrothers and stepsisters. He's fled on a boat for Thailand. From there, he's taken a plane to a place called Pomona, California. He sent a letter saying we should all leave too. By the time the war was over, I had finished college. I'd been trained as a teacher. I was working as a supervisor on a dam project. In 1978, I met your father, Sigmuda. Your father was a water buffalo gangster boy with some college but no degree. Your father was working on the dam as a construction worker. He was tall, dark skinned, and had strong, thick shoulders. In the field, he did not stand out from the rest of the hard-working men toiling beneath the hot sun. It was not until your father and his crew needed more gas and oil for their machines, and he came into my office to make the request that I noticed him. That day, he was happy, so he smiled at me. I saw the small space between his two front teeth and the lines that fanned out from his eyes. I noticed that the top of his left index finger was missing. He allowed his appreciation for the strong bones in my face and my athletic form to show. This was post-1975. The world we belonged to had toppled. The old walls had crumbled. We took a strong liking to each other, so much so that after a short period of seeing each other at work and after work, we married. Arundeth, where is Arundeth? Where is my son, my good boy? The government was slowly seeking out and killing anyone affiliated with the old administration. They had begun interviewing neighbors and friends, keen on finding who my father's children were. We couldn't stay and keep our baby boy Arunda safe, said Muta. Your father likes to say that we left Laos on a boat. He's wrong. We swam across the Mekong River. He doesn't remember like I do. Sigmuda, we never drugged your brother on the run toward the refugee camps. Arundeth was such a good boy. He was a year and a half only. Each time there were soldiers nearby, all I had to do was pull him close and whisper, shh, don't make a sound. He listened to me. 
all of us made it out alive and we didn't have to drug your brother Arunda like so many others traveling with little ones. And you, you were born on December 24th, 1981 in the refugee camp in Thailand. My beautiful baby girl with my bones on her face, my shoulders, my arms and my legs. My daughter who will one day become an athlete, not play basketball like me, but, but fall in love with volleyball and become so good at it that she will get a scholarship to go to college. You made me proud from the moment you were born, Sakuda. There was no little bird, little boy, little one who came after you. He was only six months old when he died in the refugee camp. I gave him a name with wings and he flew away from me, from us, all of us. There's a bird chirping across the still winter's night. Is he calling for me? Sigmuda, can you hear him calling for me, his mother and your mother? Sigmuda, your birthday is coming. The day you were born is almost here. This is from A Burial and a Birth, uh, written out of respect and to honor the memory of Sinutha Sigmungsai. Thank you. Thank you, Kalia. That is one of my favorite parts of this book. And I will say this, that um, if you have not gotten Kalia's latest book, it, in our last conversation, we talked about how it's almost like short stories, but essays, it is like nothing I've ever read before. And it, I have goosebumps even just thinking about some of these stories. And so it is, it is one of the most beautiful pieces of literature that I read ever. So I'm so glad you read that part. Um, I want to read a section that I actually have only read once before in another event. And I think it's um, one of the more important conversations. So just to give a quick background, like Kalia did, my, this was written with two different women. Mine was a similar process in wanting to tell stories of people who had stories, but weren't going to be in a place to tell them themselves. And in this case, it's because a woman from Myanmar and a woman from Syria have family members in danger. And so we um, gathered their stories over a process of two years. And this is a scene that really happens without refugee agents or caseworkers or other white helpers around. It was kind of one of those closed door scenes that she described. Um, Hasna is the name of the woman, the pseudonym that she uses. And I think it's really important for us to hear often as we set up thinking about resettlement, what happens, not, not what we expect to happen, but what she is actually saying is happening behind closed doors. So this was after Hasna arrived from Syria in Austin in 2016. The first knock on her door the next morning was a Syrian woman who lived a few buildings over. Hasna was so grateful to see her and hear her Arabic with its thick Aleppo accent. She nearly cried. The woman was short with gray eyes and a sharp set to her mouth that reminded Hasna a bit of one of the small dogs she had watched in Rumfa in Jordan, one of the places she'd sheltered. A small determined terrier. They greeted each other, kissing cheeks briefly and the woman introduced herself as Um Khalid. She told Hasna she had come to make sure that she had everything she needed. Hasna told her about the three cup debacle of a kitchen. The volunteers who put stuff in the kitchen got them three of everything. So there were only three of them here. So three plates, three cups, three spoons, none of it matched. Um Khalid laughed grimly. It is like they follow the exact instructions, but do not think. Did they not assume that you would ever have other people to eat or that you might sometimes want more than one plate per person? She rolled her eyes and Hasna felt cheered immediately. Some of the other women dropped by later in the day, kissing cheeks and chucking, clucking sympathetically when Umkali told them what, that Hasna had only received three of everything in the kitchen and no pots or pans. Within hours, the women had organized a meal for them. In the afternoon, one of the women who could drive took Hasna to the local halal market to buy what she needed. She had been given cash by the IOM representative who helped them. And she used almost $200 buying a cheap 10 pot and pan set and a full set of glasses and plates for their home and food for the next few days. She worried about spending so much money so quickly before she found out where the rest of the money was going to come from, but truly there was no choice. The other women, agree, other women agreed with her. She could not live in a home in which she could not cook. Her Syrian neighbors eased Hasna's first day considerably. That night, they were invited over for dinner at one of the Syrian family's apartments. The women who had taken her to the store brought their children and they talked late into the night answering all of Hasna and Jabril's questions. There, Hasna finally learned the full scope of what they had taken on. They would have to pay back the US government the full amount of their plane tickets, a debt that already felt daunting to Hasna. 
Whatever they had been told in the orientation or in the months leading up to their resettlement, it didn't matter. In fact, when Hasna named some of the things, they only laughed. A year's worth of financial support? They would not be able to afford rent past the first month, and they were in a six-month lease contract. Free medical care? They would be eligible for Medicaid, but they would need to stay on top of their paperwork or they would lose their coverage. Disability payments? They would come in a few months, but they, would, they should expect some snafu that would delay payments. An older man, balding but with a ring of thick black hair, ranted for long minutes about the United States. He told Jabril and Hazna that the United States did not care for them, but his tirade only made Hazna feel that he was asking too much of this new country. Why should anyone give them free health care and money without their working for it? Those were not the things that she wanted. His beginning premise, sure, they let our children go to school and they help us bring our families over, were the beginning and end of what she hoped for. If she had her children and Rana, her youngest, could be educated, that would be enough. Many in the group readily acknowledged that the US system did not help, did help families stay together. Some of them had already welcomed refugees, had already welcomed re relatives. Hasna could see that many of the most bitter people were also the most vocal. She suspected that several of the others did not feel as strongly as the loudest voices in the room. She sensed, even through her despair and worry, that there was a great kindness in this new country. The system was not perfect, but Americans did not cause the war in Syria and were not responsible for fixing it. And yet they had paid for the people to come from Jordan all the way over to Austin, Texas. There were thousands more Syria, refugees from Syria all over the country. What kind of people built into their law and culture and infrastructure to care for refugees from all over the world? Good people. Every country had people they were not proud of who caused problems. Syrians of all people could understand that. But this was a country that took responsibility to provide a new home for people who had lost theirs to war. By the time the man's wife succeeded in her not so subtle campaign to get her ranting husband to stop and go home, Hasna was convinced of the goodness of the people of the United States. And I do want to end with that moment of hope is then changed through the rest of the narrative. So that was how she was feeling in that moment, but I don't want to end with kind of a bright, hopeful moment. I, I want to set that up to talk about how that, how we see the failures of that as well. Thank you for that lovely reading, Jessica. Before we get into the particulars of our work, um, I know what's been happening in Texas. I was following in the last couple of weeks, and then I have also been following what's happening in Myanmar. And I want to give you an opportunity to speak um, about how you're doing, and then, of course, a brief update on how Munal's family um, is doing with everything that is going on. I mean, this is such an important part of both of our work, mm -hmm. telling these refugee stories. You don't necessarily begin where you think you're going to begin. You begin where, where we are. We always yeah. know who we are, and then we travel back and forth. So please, if you could let us all know how you, and then your, yeah, your friend is doing. Yeah. In Texas, we are doing fine. Hasna has had a had a really difficult time. Hasna was in an area of town where the lights and the and the electricity and the power and the and the water was all turned off, and so um, it was a pretty complicated season for them. Um, Muna did fine in the storm in Austin, but also her family has been in Myanmar. So she has uh, some siblings that are now currently there and some other relatives. And so when the coup hit, there was word that the, electric, the, the internet would be turned off. And so um, she wasn't able to get a hold of her family for a long time. So there, she has never done this since we published the book. She is very, like, she was happy to tell her story. And we spent two years really working on it. But She's never really wanted to be involved in the promotional part, even though you know she's been very invited and I keep sharing with her. And for the first time she asked if we could pray for her. And so I put a little Instagram post up and, and just shared what she was asking if people could pray for her family members. And so I was really grateful when she texted back that she was able to get a hold of them. But I mean, you know better than, than many people, like this is not my grief, but I am so close to people who were grieving this. And I feel like the fear among my friends who are from Myanmar has just spiked in ways that I have never seen since I've become friends with Muna in 2007. And so I think there's just so, it just feels so horrifying to me that people who have already been through so much kind of collective trauma have to revisit this again. So I don't know, I think it's a wait and see kind of game. Well, thank you so much for that update. I'm relieved and also then I, you know, I think about PTSD, how so many survivors of war 
um, so many refugees carry trauma inside and how these things trigger each other. You know, we don't need horrific events in the countries that we fled from to remember them. You know, as, as a Hmong refugee myself, um, who came to this country as a refugee child and as a daughter of refugees, it, I never know the day. It could be a gloriously bright, sunny, beautiful day like today. And my mom and dad, you know, they wake up and they don't look the way they went to bed. They're shaking because they've been running in the jungles of Laos all through the night because there was a, a rocket and a rock exploded and a piece of that rock is embedded as my father says in my hands it shakes because there's a piece of rock of a rock of memory embedded all of these things that we carry inside of us which I think gets to the heart of my question Jessica my very first question for you because I know that in writing these two women's lives, you've really entered into their lives. Can you speak to the process of just interviewing, conversating, um, this relationship that you build with both women and why you, you felt that it was their stories that you would found or find or discover this book with? Um, so because I was friends with Muna, we began together. She was um, not just my closest friend that was a former refugee, but just one of my closest friends. And so um, when the rhetoric shifted in 2015 around refugees here in Texas, yeah, I, I don't know if you guys saw that the governor is no longer requiring masks. This is the last five years under Governor Abbott have been just very wild and um, refugees were a big part of that. And so when we um, when I first realized that that was changing, I just reached out to as many friends and that as I could and said, "Do you want? Can I help tell your story? What what would be most useful for you?" And um, it became apparent quickly that Muna wanted to tell her story and that it would make a great book. And then I met Hasna in the process of kind of putting together that book proposal and just knew that she was someone I resonated with. And that's I really want to talk with you about this too because I only worked with two women, so we met every two weeks for. With Muna, an hour or two with Hasna, it was like six to eight hours. It was like a whole elaborate, we ate lunch, we made coffee and they were cookies. And it's so hard for me to imagine. It's a really intimate space telling stories in the ways that you and I have done this. Um, I have only done this with these two women. I've done other As Told Two projects, but not on the kind of scale of this. Whereas you worked with so many different people. How did you find people that you felt like you could resonate with? I mean, it's almost like a, a mind meld you have to get into, right, in order to do this. Was that easier with some people than it was with others? That is a wonderful question. So Somewhere in the Unknown World is a collection of 14 different refugee stories. The first one, I think, which planted then the seed for everything else, was with actually um, an uncle of mine. He said to me one day, I have a story to tell you and I want you to do something with this story. He says, I know you're a writer and you know that I'm a refugee, but there are things we don't know about each other's worlds. And this is a beloved uncle. And so I say to him, what do you mean? And he said, everybody says I'm a good man, but you don't survive a war like the one in Laos being a good man. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? And then he told me this incredible story about the two sisters who had approached his wife and him and their three, four children the night of the Mekong crossing and how he had this flimsy raft, which wasn't big enough for them. He would have to swim beside the raft, but how he couldn't put the two girls on. And so he told them he would return. But of course, halfway through that journey, he knew that there was no return. He talked to me about how he was becoming older every day and how in his dreams he was getting closer and closer to the edge of that river again. And how when he crossed, he would see them there in the light of the moon. And he would see in their eyes that he was not the man that they had been waiting for. The story crushed me. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote it down because that's what he asked me to do, what to do with it. I sent it to my editor, um, Reva Hockerman at Metropolitan Press. And I said, Reva, I read this thing. Can you read it? Tell me what you think. Uh -huh. And Riva read it and she said to me, would you be interested in putting a book of more stories like this? Uh -huh. You know, this is right in 2016, Donald J. Trump had just been elected. The rhetoric as, as in Texas across the country was beginning to shift and um, refugees were being portrayed in certain lights that I didn't like as a refugee myself, but also I think just as an American. Uh -huh. And so, I went into my community because I knew certain things about Minnesota. Minnesota is not high up for diversity, but we have more refugees per capita than any other state in the nation. Thanks to the refugee resettlement agencies, 
and Catholic Charities and Lutheran Social Services, these structures in the state. And so I, I, I wanted to look into my community. And it was also a time, I have little ones, little kids, and they're always looking for heroes. And they yeah. often go to the big silver screen or they sometimes go into their books. But I, I wanted to tell them that there were heroes in our lives. Yeah. And so Sia is the receptionist at their pediatrician's office. George's kids go to school with them. You know, and so these things came together very organically and very naturally. Mm -hmm. And of course, I went to parts of the cities that I don't, that I, I didn't have a great familiar familiarity with to discover and to learn, because I wanted to know the flavors of these places. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know the smells and the scent. Um, and then there was the work of writing. And I knew that what I would offer in the end would never be an, a, a reflection of these individuals. They can look into the mirrors and see this for themselves the ragged, the force of gravity and other, other forces, I was going to offer them a portrait crafted through my lens, that of a writer and an artist, um, speaking to who I saw and what I heard when I heard their stories. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. The whole book reads like a collection of short stories. Um, but of course, it took a long time to get there. As a person from a marginalized background myself, representation was important. I wanted to offer something singular and I wanted it to be useful first for each of these individuals and their communities and then a bigger world. And so it is an, my most ambitious literary undertaking. And I, I think a successful one because uh, many of them have written me and they have wept. Mm -hmm. They've discovered new things about their stories that they themselves didn't quite, wouldn't have articulated or didn't quite see in the ways and the light with which I, I was looking. And so it was incredibly moving, you know, I feel like my heart is more planted in this place than ever before. Yeah. So this is, you know, it's an intimate process. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But unlike you, Jessica, I knew that if I met with them day in and day out, I would want to write the books of their lives. It can be <laughs> as a quote. If Hazmed had her way, we would have had like several volumes, like just the amount of information that we got. She's like, right, let's start back at least three generations ago. And so, right, it is such a hard, hard thing figuring out like what is the snippet to tell. One of the things I really want to talk to you about, and so um, you are both an insider and an outsider into this conversation. I am very clear about being an outsider, and I think it is often very, very important that those of us, so often damage has been done by those of us who are outsiders putting our own emotions over groups as they're affected, right? And so I, I think it's so important for us to say, you know, again, like I was saying earlier, this doesn't affect me, but it affects people I love. And sometimes there's a weird distance that we do too and in, in not appropriating, we act as if people are not human. So there's a tension that we're kind of living in of being both inside and outside of some of these stories. And so I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about um, what is a response that we can have, those of us who are adjacent to this kind of trauma, who are tuned into it and engaged with it without taking over. How have you navigated that in your own life? That is a wonderful question. And so Somewhere in the Unknown World is my fourth book for adults. Mm -hmm. It is not a book that I could have written in 2008 when my first one came out or 2016 when my second one came out or even 2020 or like 2019 when the, uh, the third one came out. It took a long time and it took a long time for me to gain the confidence in my own abilities as an artist mm -hmm. that I could do their stories justice. But then also at some point, Jessica, for me, it became a question of whether I mean, why wasn't I writing this book? Is it because I was afraid? Or is it because my faith wasn't strong enough? Mm -hmm. It became a very spiritual question for me. Mm -hmm. The journey was painful and it was long, but in the end, there was no reason for me not to write the book. Mm -hmm. you know? I have this memory of being a kid and feeling like I was a pretty ugly kid and not, not, you know, not particularly bright. And yet hearing the dreams that my mom and dad had for me, these incredible dreams where I would do incredible things. And I, I told my dad, well, I didn't tell him. He had a tape recorder by his bedside because my dad's a beautiful song poet in the Hmong tradition. And whenever his compositions come, he records them. And so one day mom and dad left for work and I pressed record and I told them that I was the biggest failure in their lives, the one that they didn't know was coming. That there was no way somebody so small, somebody so dumb, somebody so cowardly could ever be all of the things that they'd imagined was possible inside of me. 
it was very tearful and very full of teenage angst. <laughs> and then after it was done, I forgot about it. And mom and dad didn't say anything for weeks, you know? And then one day my dad came and the moan gesture of love is, you know, you, you sweep the hair back from the face. Um, so my dad, he has incredibly rough hands because he spent most of his life as a, as a machinist in the factories of Minnesota. He starts sweeping back the hair from my face. And of course, every time he does this, I still myself, I'm not going to act like it hurts because he might stop. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like trying to, you know, like, you know, not ignore the tangle in my hair. And my dad tells me, whatever you are, you're the best chance. You're the only chance for us going forward. The only gift that was given on this journey. And, it, and you are enough. Mm-hmm. Your best is always going to be enough. I think about that moment in, in all of the work that I do, the projects that I take on, the speaking invitations that I accept. It is never, never comes from a place where I know I'm going to do a great job, but it comes from this place where I believe that my best effort is perhaps our best chance. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, the meaning of our changes with time. It used to be my, our family and that my community, and now it is like as an American writer. Yeah. You know, what I have to give here is my best gift for the world, not my worst, not some cheap shot that I'm shooting into the dark in the hopes of, you know, exploding the sky. It is my most tender, my most beautiful, the most living thing I have to give. Each is a love letter to each individual. You know, all my books are love letters to people, mm-hmm. people of the past, people of the present, and the people of tomorrow. I imagine that one day I'll be dead because I will, and that my, my children will live on, and then their, their children, and so on and so forth, and that whenever any of them would, whenever they open my books, that they would find a testament of my great love on those pages for this gift, this gift that we share together, mm-hmm. and so I don't know if this is like the answer you're looking for, because it is, um, for me, such a spiritual process, you know, but I, I have a question for you, and that has to do with the reception of the book. So now the book is out, Jessica, and it's making its way around the world. Is, is the journey of the book what you anticipated and imagined? Um, if yes, in what ways? If no, where, where has it faltered from the journey that you had perhaps hoped for? Um, first, I'm going to reflect back on that question, because what an extraordinary answer. And I think um, what I heard from you that was so that just really resonated with me is so often we think, what are the specific actions that I can take? And instead, what you were saying is do your best in love and and it will be a gift. And I think it speaks to a lot of um, the conversations we often have. Like, I, I promise you, I have messed up so many times in relation to the people that I am close friends with and representing them is such a, it's a harrowing experience. I, I had so many dreams that when I think on what I was hoping the book would do, I had so many fears about the, what the book either wouldn't do or how I would damage, do damage. So my PhD is in basically like all the white ways that people, white people have, all the ways that white people have done damage by appropriating other people's stories. And there are just thousands upon thousands of examples. And I think um, for me, um, I, I just loved kind of the the grace and intentionality in your answer. And I think that is that for me has been one of the things I've learned as well is that g- desiring to be in community with people, listening to and not imposing myself on them and taking the next best step has been the the way in which I've moved forward. And I think that's that's what happened with this book. You know, for me, success with this book was where Hasna and Muna pleased. And so everything after that has been um icing on the cake. Um, I I didn't anticipate a global pandemic as you didn't either, (laughs) but in some ways it's been incredibly rich because I have gotten to do so many conversations like this over lunch and get to connect with people all over the country. So I, there have been some, not advantages, I don't want to have advantages during a pandemic, but there have been moments of, I think, real, um, that have just been different from what I expected. I do think that this book has, has, done I mean there there have been just a lot of really great moments too that I did not anticipate and I feel really grateful um, for my editor and the, the whole team my agent for um, setting this book up in the beginning and I, I feel like this is I want this to be the first of many steps and so I, I really like genuinely this is a question this is the first question that I emailed you the other day and I really want to hear the answer to this because it's just very selfish for me because I really want to hear 
your thoughts on this. So my next book is going to be a, um, it's not going to be a community memoir in the same way that yours was, but it is, um, when I was reading your book, I was, when I was working my book proposal, I was reading your book and I just kept loving the way that you give a portrait of an entire community. So Svetlana Alexeyevich is one of my favorite writers and she talks about herself as a portrait painter. And so she has, it's almost like a hall of portraits that you walk through when you read her work. And I felt that way with yours. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is go back to my own family's past and look at what our like what were the stories that we received as white people and especially in Texas and what's the actual truth of what happened and I was also reading Matthew Celestis's um, craft book and it is so good and he just kept talking about individuals versus community and how many um, cultures have community stories so I would just love to this is this is a very grand question there's a lot of in that but I would love to hear you talk about you know, working against this kind of Western centric individualistic um, storytelling mode. And instead, like though you not just in this last book, but in a lot of your books, you really tell these kind of community books. What's important about that? And um, why do you feel like that's really important for us to hear? Such a wonderful question. Um, so I'm teaching a course right now called Writing Culture into Memoir. And, you know, I'm teaching it because I'm interested in studying and exploring and thinking it over some more, but also because I have some experience entangling with culture in memoir. Memoir in this country has traditionally been stories of wealthy people, famous people, people who we're interested in already. Um, and that is definitely not the case of the memoirs that I write. The very first one, The Late Homecomer, was about an old woman who could not read or write. You know, an old woman whose biggest fear was that she would be forgotten, my grandma, who all of my life with her signed her name with a shaky X that stood in for Joa Lee. You know, even as a child, every time I see her sign her name, I wanted to write it everywhere. I wanted to paint the whole world with Joa Lee's name. When my grandma passed away, I was 22 years old. I knew that I was lucky because I had, I had had 22 years with her, and yet I was not ready to let her go. In the beginning, you know, if somebody had told me, Kalia, you're going to write a memoir and it's going to be about your life too, I would have said, no, I'm way too young, way too inexperienced, not, no. I thought and I believed, Jessica, that I was writing a story about my grandma's life. It wasn't until I was already more than halfway through that I realized I was documenting our very own history, the history of my people. Yeah. And then in that way that I was writing the origin story of who I would become. And, and this is the trickiest answer for you. And I wish I could give you an easier one. And my students wish I could give them an easier one as well. But the reality is that books take us in directions and places we don't quite anticipate. And that is the gift of the writing process. If we write only to document what we know, the world would never be interested. You know, it is when we reach beyond and we to discover things that we didn't know of our own stories, our own families and our own lives that we are offering to a bigger world, the gifts of the human experience. Every author in the world writes of the human experience from where we are positioned. So specificity is key. Hmm. The more specific you can be, the more correct you are, yeah. regardless of how you're writing it and attacking it. And then I always say this to my students and it's just a friendly reminder to a gifted writer. You know, sometimes it isn't a question of craft. Most often it is about the power of the story that you are telling. If you can trust in the power of that story, it doesn't quite matter how you go about it. You'll be okay in the end because there's a force there that will guide you. You just have to stick true, you know? I, persistence and passion are like the two, I think, biggest markers in a writer's journey, whether they succeed or whether they fail among other conditions of, of our respective societies. But for me, I'm always riding a bigger wave. There is a wave, there's a current going above my head, you know, and I'm holding sometimes only by a fingernail, but I trust that current. That is how I, I mean, that is the only reason why, why, why any writer would do literature, right? Mm -hmm. To be in conversation with the times. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to become timeless in that regard. And so I hold fast to the power of the story and I let it drag me wherever it needs to drag me, especially in that first incarnation. Mm -hmm. Because the book reincarnates in the process. Mm -hmm. it, has, it has to. Otherwise, you won't be able to hold the momentum for a year or two or three or four or five, right? The average in this country to write a book is five years. Wow. That takes a great deal of holding on 
and a great deal of momentum. And so I find this powerful stories. Like I knew at the onset that every single story in somewhere in the honor world was a powerful one. I knew this because I trusted in the individuals. I trust in individuals. You know, I knew in my own heart that whenever, didn't matter who they are, if they were going to sit with me and tell me their stories, I was going to write something about it. I was not going to be one of those authors or scholars who, who would walk away because there was a better case study or because an angle has shifted. You know, I was going to work with the building materials that were there. And I think that is the, that is the job of every artist. We have to work with what is there. You know, whether it is somebody's memories or research, whatever is there, we're at the table, the pieces, the puzzle are on and we do what we will with it. We build and we create something that has never existed before. And so for me, I mean, it's that spark and that magic that happens in the process, but it is also this very humble reminder that we begin exactly where we are. I love that. And you talk about being a writer, but don't you feel like in some ways that each book, it's like being a parent, right? Like there are some things that you learn, but each child is so incredibly unique that you also come at them for like what worked for one doesn't work for the other. And I, I think I, I knew this with my head, but starting my second book, I would think, yeah, this is, it's a total, it's a totally different kind of complicated. How has that been for you really crossing genres? You've had children's books, you've had other stuff as well. Um, and I also want to be careful, Stina, to get, I know you might have some questions as well. So if you need us to quit talking, I'm sure we could do this all day. So you let us know. You go right ahead. This is wonderful. You know, I, so I'll say this, you are absolutely right, Jessica, each book is different, but each book happens when we are different. Does that make sense? With my first child, I was very different. Yeah. My, with my twins, I, I have become entirely different. In fact, just today I was ruminating about how we have no practical skills. Like the boys are five and there's no practical skills because it was more efficient for me to do most of the practical things. Mm -hmm. um, and now all they want to talk about our newest word of the day are, are you know, our complex con uh, concepts, mm -hmm. big ideas, you know? And, and I'm like, oh, you know, didn't do so well there. This summer is gonna be a lot of practical skills in our home, right? And the same is true of all of my books. I mean, I knew that The Late Homecomer was always gonna be a young person's book, Jessica. It was always going to be a young person's book. The, the, the song poet, you know, would, would mark that time, the eight years in between, all of the growing I had done as a writer and as a public speaker, all of it would be manifested there. And then there were these other books, you know, What God Has Honored Here. It's a book that I wish I, 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 wish I was never in a position to write. Mm -hmm. Once to lose a pregnancy or a baby mm -hmm. or, or suffer, you know, with the systemic forces at play. Um, so some stories come to us and some stories we have to chase and others we have to discover, you know, each story has its own journey and they have their own powers. And I understand that every book is nothing more than a picture of me in time. I mean, that's the gift that I accept, you know, mm -hmm. when I, I can't wait to be 75 and if I'm still writing to write the messiest book of my life and yet the bravest book of my life, you know, because I will have to understand then that it might be my last. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking the next book and the next book and the next book because stories are all around me, mm -hmm. but there will be a day I know when I will understand that the thing I write may be my very last mm -hmm. and that will be a phenomenally different book. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I look forward to that part of the journey. It would be a privilege and a blessing to be 70 years old with these tiny little fingers, to <laughs> on the, you know, whatever it is that I, I will be typing on. You know, but but that's I think my relationship to the books. Yeah. Each represents a picture of my heart and my head in time. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so good. Sina, I could keep asking questions of Clea all day. Do you guys have some QA that you wanna? Yeah. So um people who are in the webinar, um, if you have questions for Jessica or for Kalia, please um go ahead and, and start putting those in there. We'll do some QA. I think while we're waiting for people to to put in their questions, I'd love to hear, you know, the College Bill Institute is a place where people of faith come, whether they're scholars, artists, writers, um, pastoral leaders, um, whether that's within the Christian tradition or in a multi-religious uh, setting. And I'm just curious how faith has intersected with your work. Um, so maybe as you guys are answering this question, other folks, please please chime in and, and ask questions for Jessica and Kalia, because this is a great opportunity. 
Um, I will say that our shared faith was the most important thing in the process that I um, went into with Muna, with Hasna, and with our translator, Amina. And she's the unspoken person in this, but I could not have done any of this book without her. She sat, the three of us sat together. She is originally from Syria, but has lived in the United States for a long time. And she's one of those gifted translators who doesn't just translate word for word, but provides context. And is, I know the three of us were able to have conversations that almost didn't stop. They just kind of this continuous flow of question and answer and story and context. Um, and I, I think so often we have, I know when I was growing up, I grew up as a Christian and had very um, limited views of what faith was and who was in and who was out and where the lines were. And as an adult, one of the great joys of my life has been that those lines have been changed and stretched and blurred. And um, there is no one that prays for me more than Amina and Hasna. I mean, it is a constant and really joyous thing in my life. We are still in a WhatsApp group and that their daughter, uh, Hasna's daughter, Layla, who is in Europe right now, is also in that group. And it is a constant like, oh, it looks like ice is coming, praying for you. Oh, I'm thinking about you today. I miss you. I'm praying for you. And it is something that is really so beautiful. And I think gave me... Um, and, and I respond to them that way as well. And I loved this. I think one of the, the gifts people often view Syria, Americans often view Syria as a place of war or conflict. If they know anything about it, maybe they'll, they'll know about like the chemical weapons against the children and all of that is horrible. But the Syria that Hasna and Amina describe is a place where people of all faiths are able to connect well with each other. And I feel like that was the great gift as I got a piece of that Syria in our conversations. And with Muna, it just was so beautiful watching for years how her faith sustained her um, in some of the darkest times in my life. She was one of the first five people that I called and said, like, how, how do I do this? And it's, it's because she is, for me, an example. It's more than just a, she told me about her faith, but for me, someone who, whose faith has really guided them, and I have learned so much from her. So I'm the granddaughter of four shamans. All of my grandparents were shamans, but I only grew up with the one grandma I knew. Uh, my grandfathers died when my mom and dad were just children. And then when my mom was 16, she left her mother behind uh, for a life with my father, not knowing that they would never see each other again. Wow. She was 16. And she says that is the dream that she keeps waking up from. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my grandma, the one grandma that I knew, a respected shaman and a medicine woman and a healer. She used to tell me because I was born with this incredible fear of the dark. And I, I, my heart would start beating and everything would go south. She used to tell me that in the dark, there was a lot of room for friends. And that I should call on all of the good forces that are possible. She would say, you know, Jesus, the Dalai Lama, Buddha, you know, your ancestors call on everything good that the world has to offer to be your friend in the dark. And those words guided me on my journey, you know? Um, every time I'm afraid, I call on everything that is good to make me strong, to help steady my fluttering heart, um, just for a little bit more, a little bit longer. It's very moment by moment for me. You know, grandma in her infinite wisdom also said that life was nothing more than moments strong on the thread of time. And that while it is impossible for any one human being to give our all to all of life, because that's simply too much, too big, if we give our all to the moment that we make possible the next. And so faith is this thing that I'm always continually um, searching for, finding all the time through all of the spaces of my life. I don't think it's a coincidence that my husband is also the son of two um, Lutheran ministers, mm -hmm. you know, both, both, both ordained by the church. Um, he himself would not say, I think, that he's a Christian boy, although he was raised in the tradition. Um, but there is this thing I find in spirituality and religion in the most essential and functional ways. Um, this focus on being the very best and the kindest that we can be. Mm -hmm. When I applied to college and I went to Carleton College, I said in my personal statement, um, my community needs me to be a doctor, but I I need to become the best person I can be. You might be the, the place for me if you, if you can help me with that. That was my personal statement. And so it is connected to every element of my life and every single role that I occupy. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I, I wanna leave all of you with a, again, a bit of wisdom from my grandma. Um, every time we have the power to help somebody, know that you have the ability to hurt them mm -hmm. and let that guide you in your response. 
that's also something that I think a lot about in my role as a writer, um, a teacher, a mother. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you both, to both of you for sharing. Um, there is a question here um, actually asking about the Texas governor um, and the mask, the mask mandate, which I think Jessica, you referred to. She's asking, um, how does this impact the refugee community? Does it bring fear? Will it bring false hope? What's going on with vaccination? And, um, you know, I'm sure each refugee community is different in this approach, but um, yeah. yeah, can you speak to that? You know, I'm only comfortable speaking on behalf of the people that I personally know. And so I will say one of the things that I think is, is really important for us to talk about is that many of the former refugees, and I use, and just, if this is just really helpful if anybody is ever interested in this, I use the phrase former refugees for people who live here because they are no longer refugees. And so they've been here, you know, many of them for five, 10, 20 years. And that was a short time period in their life and it was just a visa category. It doesn't define who they are, right? And so many of the former refugees that I know who live here, um, have very different political views than I do. And I think we often have this expectation that, you know, because the Biden administration is going to be reopening refugee resettlement, that all refugees are voted for Biden, and that's really not the case. Um, so I know many people who are probably very happy about ending the mask mandate and are very supportive of a lot of the policies that I find really concerning, but they um, it, it connects well with them. And so um, I think so for those people, I think that they will be really pleased about it. I know they're going to be glad that businesses are reopening at 100% because I think that has been something that's been very complicated for some of the people that I know. Um, for me, I'm, I'm less happy about it and feel very concerned about it. And I'm especially concerned for um, people like Hasna and others who have um, some health conditions and some other things. And I think right now what's happening with the vaccinations, I've actually been trying to figure out how I can get Hasna and Jabril, her husband, to a vaccination site. But in, in Texas, you basically have to be on seven different apps and be ready to go at a moment's notice to another city. And it's not something that can work out with her schedule and so her work schedule. And so just recognizing the very deep limitations for people who work in hourly jobs or who have the kind of jobs where like the ice storm knocked out rent for you know, like affected their rent because they weren't working for a week. So living paycheck to paycheck does not is not conducive for chasing vaccines on a website if you can't read in English. And so I think, um, I think that's the, the, this one case has really highlighted what the difficulties are not just here in Texas but around the country, but especially here in Texas where we have like one of the worst vaccination rates in the in the country. So I have a lot of rage today, and so I'm not quite sure where to put that. This is this was a surprise for all of us yesterday, and we're not sure what to do. So. Um, I'm hoping that it doesn't affect former refugees. I have lived here long enough to assume that it will be uh, former refugees and their neighbors who will be most affected. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful, um, for just your thoughts. But, but I do have something to say, and I think this, I think exemplifies part of the complication of even discussing refugees, you know? Uh -huh. Former refugee, it's such an interesting thing. I was born a refugee in a refugee camp. I was born a stateless child. And even today as an American author, more often than not, people link me to the refugee experience because it is the subject of my people and my, I mean, the place from which I arise as a human being, you know? And so the term former refugees is so interesting to me because my mom and dad in America and the landscape of Minnesota and otherwise, they're still seen as newcomers, as refugees. You know, when people see my people in my family, it isn't like, oh, there's a former refugee or a Hmong American. It's like, oh, there's some remnant from some war. This uh -huh. is communicated in a thousand different ways, you know? Uh -huh. And so it's this truth of our lives that even I, as a writer, refuse to let go of, you know? Uh -huh. If I'm going to be a refugee in your eyes, then you will meet me and my stories in the depth of my humanity every time. Yeah, you know, and I think I feel like it's um if I let that go, or if my parents, or you know, um, we will be caught off guard, and the consequences are oftentimes deadly, as we've seen in this country time and again. So it's an interesting thing. I mean, as as writers and as you know, people who are focused on the words, the pushing mm -hmm. the edges of meaning, but also piecing it together to get at these truths, right? Our relationship to language, I think, is very um, it's 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 so reflected of where we're positioned. Mm -hmm. Anne Fadiman, who has this book called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. And Anne is a friend of mine. Um, but when, you know, in her book, she says, Hmong people do one of two things in moments of danger. They flee or they fight. 
my life came from a moment when there was no fleeing or fighting. Mm -hmm. The wait was sometimes 10 or 20 or 30 years, depending on who you are, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm like, but Anne could only write about it that way because she saw it that way. Right. Yeah. And her book is a book about like two cultures in collision, right? With, with, with the medical industry. But of course there was never a collision. There was no way in America that the Hmong community, that that family without literacy on their side, the ability to speak the language and to document it down, that they were gonna have a chance against the monster that is the medical industrial com complex in this country. But Anne could only ever see it that way because yeah. that's where she was positioned. You know, and so positionality, I think, is so key and so challenging in these conversations. Like, who is a former refugee? Um, am I a former refugee? I came here as a six-year-old. You know, Minnesota, I've known this place longer than I've known any other place in the world. And yet, in the eyes of a bigger public, um, in the eyes of a bigger world, I'm an eternal refugee. And I think my spirit is to continually looking for a way to build a home, if not in life, then in the words that lives in my heart. I love that, Kalia. And thank you so much for sharing that. I think, you know, when you were talking about the dangers of, or like each book is a representation of time, I think that is so true of so many books, even the best books. And I think all of us have that awareness who are writing books, but I might, my, my my fear in writing a book about a culture that's not mine is that I will do damage, like I said, but there's, it's just an inevitable thing, right? I think in some ways the damage is going to be inevitable or there will be moments of slippage in ways that feel inevitable. My least favorite verb is humanize. I've written two pieces in which I kind of rail against the fact that people always, that's the thing that people praise the most about my work, that I humanized this issue. And it makes me want to claw something because these are humans. Why, why is the baseline that people need to be reminded about other people's humanity, right? And so I think the um, American sensationalism and the fact that we, like you, you'll see the trope for every story that almost always begins with war for telling journeys of people who are fleeing their country. It's always like the most and the biggest and the, the bombs and the missiles and I find I get so frustrated with that because that is a maybe two day experience or a three year experience, but it doesn't summarize the, um, you know, love and hope and family connections and all the things that make people people that and they should never have to be I understand why we say this because we do dehumanize people but I just hate that we even have to have this conversation right. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I think maybe this is a perfect time to, to share a little bit of Gany's story. So this is only a paragraph. But there's a man called Fanny who lives in these cities and he's an office worker by day and a Lyft driver by night. He's only 30 years old, but all of his hair is white. And when I talked to him, he had this thing that he was looking for and he came to Minnesota to find, and it's called a certificate of humanity. And I think it speaks beautifully, beautifully to, um, to what Jessica is saying. So, so at this point, Afghani is in, um, a five-star resort in Sweden that's been turned into a refugee camp because they wanted money from the government. So um, he has to go see a camp psychologist because he's asking everybody for a certificate of humanity. And so this is that paragraph. The camp psychologist got to know me well. At first, she was unsure about my mental health. She was baffled by my request for a certificate of my humanity. She asked me if I believed I was human. I said, of course, but other people weren't so sure. So I needed help proving my humanity. She then offered to provide me with such proof. But why, I asked her, what is the difference between you and me? How come you're more human than me in a position to observe and certify my humanity? After all, do not have the same blood, the same makeup, the same dreams even? Why are you more successful in your humanity than I am in mine? I told her that if she was going to give me a certificate of humanity, she would have to show me hers first. I had to know who had given her the authority to determine human certification. And that's from a Fanny story, you know, something that a writer couldn't have, I couldn't have come up with on my own, you know, it was what he was looking for, what he'd been looking for for the last 10 years and what perhaps he'll look for for the rest of his life. You know, and then those are just the truths that we have to sit with. And part of, I think, doing the work like, like you and me, Jessica, is that we have to sit with the uncomfortable truths 
the complicated truths of people's lives mm -hmm. and our own lives, because it is a, an admission of our vulnerability as individuals. Perfect. I can't think of anything to say that would end better than the certificate of humanity. That may be one of the, my, my favorite paragraphs. It just so beautifully, and you're right. It's one of those things that you could never make up. It just so beautifully epitomizes that search that feels like an ongoing search for so many people. So unfortunately, thank you. Well, thank you to both for this wonderful hour. It's already one o'clock and I feel like it just went by in a snap and I would just encourage everyone who is who's listening to please go out <clears throat> and buy uh, Jessica and Kalia's books because that positionality is something that we all need to, to question. And it's by reading these stories and entering into different worlds that we can really grow and learn and, and, and change how we view other people. Um, so thank you to you both for sharing your knowledge and insight and stories with us. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody else who's here in this webinar um, or watching on Facebook Live. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I also wanna quickly say that you are also invited to future College Real Connection events. Um, there is event information and registration details on our website and on our social media platforms. And actually next Wednesday, March 10th, same time, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Father Columbus Stewart, who is a Collegeville Institute resident scholar and a member of our very own St. John's Abbey monastic community. And he will be presenting on Benedictine monasticism as a way of life, its origins and future. So please go check that out and register. And I just wanna say thank you again to you both um, for joining us and for, for sharing with us today. Thank you, thanks Collegeville. It's one of my favorite places. Thank you. Thanks, Kalia. Thank you, Jessica. 